My name is Tom Mesereau. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, I was lead uh, defense counsel for Michael Jackson in his trial in Santa Barbara in 2005. And I'm here to support uh, journalist Aphrodite Jones, who wrote a book about the trial. My name's Aphrodite Jones. I'm a reporter, investigative journalist, been writing real life crime stories for 20 years. I have seven books, best selling books, published about real life murders. I've covered some of the most high profile cases in the history of America, including Scott Peterson and then Michael Jackson. The subject of my newest book is uh, Michael Jackson and the truth behind the trial. And that is to say that the media slanted the coverage of the Traction trial in order to give the public the impression that Michael Jackson was guilty in 2005 when in fact a jury of 12 people found the man to be completely innocent. It's an excellent book. It's the most accurate, honest portrayal of what happened in the Michael Jackson courtroom. I wrote the foreword to the book, although I have no financial interest in the book whatsoever and I didn't write any of it. But I wrote the foreword because I wanted to make sure people realized this was the authentic, the actual story about what happened in that courtroom. And I support it. You know, the interest of the media in slanting any story is very simple. It's ratings. And we, as a public, feed that. We are very interested in anybody's dirt, anybody's dirty laundry. Um, if there are allegations to be made, it doesn't matter if they're true or not. They'll be thrown out there by the media. And it can ruin a person's career. You notice recently David Copperfield, I believe, uh, lost a lot of his uh, credibility because there was an accusation that he went after some female. No proof, no evidence, no trial, no charges, but an accusation that led to a man who's one of the most brilliant magic magicians on earth to having uh, a career fall. So this is something that's become prevalent. It's a huge problem in our society. We do uh, listen to media reports as if they're gospel. In fact, media reports are not gospel. In fact, they are um, very much driven by a rating system that includes what can we report that is dirty and gritty and nasty. And that's what happened to Michael Jackson in the 2005 trial, and nobody bothered to correct it when the man was exonerated 14 times in a Santa Maria courthouse. And did she interview you for the, the uh, book? Well, during the trial, I wouldn't look at Ms. Jones. I wouldn't wave at her. I wouldn't smile at her. I want nothing to do with her because I associated her with the media who I thought was very anti-Michael Jackson. About a year after the verdicts, I bumped into her accidentally at a art gallery in Beverly Hills. And we started chatting, and I told her I wanted nothing to do with her during the trial. I didn't like her reporting. I didn't like what the media was doing, for the most part. And she told me that she felt bad about the way the case had been reported. She'd been thinking a lot about it, and she wanted to set the record straight with an honest, accurate book that would, in fact, criticize the media. I still wasn't sure if I believed her or trusted her, but she started sending me drafts of the book, and I quickly concluded I think she's trying to be honest. So I encourage her to keep sending me the drafts. Uh, if she had any factual questions, uh, I answered them. I also did let her interview me on a number of occasions about what happened in the Michael Jackson case. And then uh, after seeing what she really was trying to do that I thought was uh, quite courageous and honest, I agreed to write the foreword to the book. I think I actually proposed it, to tell you the truth. I'm very supportive of what she's done. Well, the reaction from publishers was very flat and solid. When I came to New York and asked them, to, I told them I wanted to publish a book that was going to talk about Michael Jackson not guilty, they said, we don't want anything that's pro-Jackson. And I actually called even one of the publishers that I've worked with for many years and spoke to the top person there. And she said, Aphrodite, I'm sorry, we can't do anything pro-Jackson. And I thought, this is wild. So in other words, the, the publishing world has decided that there will be nothing pro-Jackson even though a courtroom has exonerated this man. So it ultimately came to me that I had to self-publish. And it's something that for me as a New York Times bestselling author, having had three books made into films and, and all the rest of it, really was a hard nut to, to crack and, and a hard uh, thing to swallow. But I decided that it was a, a, um, a work of love, a labor of love, that I should self-publish and uh, get the story out there. And it has been worthwhile because I have people from all over the world 
now reading this and looking at what is the other side of the Michael Jackson story and realizing that there is a conspiracy and the conspiracy is that the media has conspired to destroy this man's reputation and career. Well, I'm very proud of Ms. Jones for writing the book. I think it took some courage and some dedication. And I support the book and I hope people read it because it is the truth. And I think there's a collective embarrassment in the world of media, which includes publishing, about the way Michael Jackson was treated during this trial. The reporting was extremely biased, in many ways bigoted, it was narrow-minded, it was sensationalist, and it was designed to create stories. And I think they began to spin themselves uh, about what was happening in the courtroom. And when there was a collective gasp over the 14 not guilty verdicts, I think they sort of went into a shell and wanted to move on to something else and not acknowledge their embarrassment. What was Michael Jackson like during the trial? He's a wonderful person. He's a very sensitive, kind-hearted individual, likes to see people do well, likes to think that he's made some contributions to the planet. He's tried to advance the cause of children around the world for many, many years. He used to have a rule that before he did a concert, he would always visit a children's hospital. And he did his best to help children with disabilities, children who are deformed, children who have diseases, children who have problems. He always turned Neverland open to inner city kids who he felt didn't have the opportunities that he wanted to give them at Neverland to enjoy themselves, to have fun, to be around animals, to be around beauty. Uh, he's a wonderful person and I think very, very highly of him. What type of access did you have for information about the trial? Where did you get your information? I work, have worked in the courtrooms for, uh, as I say, almost 20 years and so I've become very adept at how to approach judges and attorneys for information. It was such that I asked Judge Melville um, if I could be granted a court order to look at all the evidence and he did grant me that order. I was able to therefore get to all of the evidence, um, the photos, the videos, the clip of the young accuser talking to the police, which actually convinced me more than ever that the whole case was a sham because not only did the jury foreman tell me that the jurors did not believe him, but I myself rewound that tape three times and looked at this boy and thought, he's telling the police that he doesn't know simple things about sexuality and he's 13 years old. There's something wrong with this picture. Um, so I was granted the, uh, the access to all of the evidence um, through Judge Melville's court order. And then later, um, with Thomas Mesro, um, having gained his trust, I was able to get to some of the court transcripts that I needed to uh, fill out uh, what it was, the notes that I took. Remember, I covered this trial every day for five solid months for Fox News, and so I had copious notes of my own. Um, and all of the news reports that were there and all the newspapers that were there as well as backup, which I used to corroborate things. So um, I, I generally take my sources straight from the horse's mouth, from court transcripts, from evidence, exhibits, and, uh, and then fill it in with what I see that other writers and other people have uh, sort of picked up on in, in the course of a trial. Well, it, it was the most intensely watched trial in world history. You had over 2,200 accredited media from around the world, which is more media than O.J. Simpson and Scott Peterson combined. And the verdicts were watched all over the planet when they came down. So it was a pretty intense environment. I had to focus myself on the courtroom, on the jurors, on the judge, on the witnesses, and tune out mo most of what was happening around me. I think Michael Jackson is a wonderful person, sensitive, kind, generous, very artistic, very creative, and on a mission to do something for the world, which is more than I can say for a lot of people I've met. <laughs> Everybody out in YouTube land, if you would, think about this. Michael Jackson is the number one entertainer known to the world. Why are we still crucifying this man? He was found not guilty. Lastly, who's your favorite courtroom videographer? Uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> okay.